uh, experts on food systems, sustainable food systems, EPES food. Um, at EPES, we, we have discussed and debated a lot issues about agroecology. So I think that fits in very well with uh, today's discussion. But of course, here we're also going to be hearing more about human rights. Um, and I really, um, I really think that this question of the connection between human beings and nature, um, and, and, as, and as it says in this issue of the watch, actually, we are part of nature. It's not even a question of connection. We are part of nature. is such a fundamental question um, and an issue that I really think um, we need to uh, really look deeply within ourselves as individuals, but then also within our communities and our countries um, to try to understand what's broken in this connection, which so many of us feel is broken. But at the same time, looking at what Fian uh, is, uh, is inviting us to do is to not just look at the personal side, but also at the political side, including human rights. Um, so we have a couple of, uh, let's say, housekeeping or technical issues that I have to go through now quickly with you. Just to let everyone know, this webinar is going to be, is being recorded and will be available online later uh, on the FIAN website and on YouTube. So if you, if you don't want to, to say anything that you want that may put you at risk later, be aware that this is going to be recorded. Um, again, I would ask you to kindly mute your microphones and the camera, turn it off if you're not the person speaking. This helps to just manage the discussion and especially helps with bandwidth um, in some places with low bandwidth. Um, in terms, we have, we have interpretation in, from Spanish and English in this chat. Um, and so there are some um, technical issues which will help us to make this interpretation easier. And you can read them in the chat. Um, uh, so in the chat in English and Spanish, for example, to speak slowly um, uh, and um, about um, how to choose the language that you want to listen to. It's English, Spanish, or you can also, if you sometimes hear the two together, because that sometimes happens, just choose mute original audio. Um, and lastly, we would ask you to um, really join in the conversation. We want this to be as interactive as possible. We would ask you to, if you're in the Zoom, to raise your hand and not to type questions in the chat box because we really want to hear your, your voice and the passion behind your voice. So please raise your hand. Um, and um, basically we will have um, uh, an overview of this edition of The Watch. Uh, by Philip Suffert. Um, and after that, we will hear from each of our panelists. I will just briefly mention them by name, but introduce them later um, when I ask, when we get to the questions. So we have Danny Carranza, who is Secretary General of Katarungan from the Philippines. We, are, we have Esther Stanford Jose, co founder of the Extin Extinction Rebellion Internationalist Solidarity Network. We have Marta Rizaferre, who is director of the chair in agroecology and food systems at the University of Vic. We have Marcos Orellana, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. And as I mentioned, we have Philip Suffert, who is human rights practitioner at Fian International. So uh, thank you um, in advance to all the panelists. Um, and I'd like to now give the floor to Philip who will give us an overview of the watch and some of the key issues that we hope to deepen in our discussion today. Philip? Thank you very much, uh, Mariam, and um, um, hello to, to all of you, um, and welcome to also from my side to this um, event um, today. As Mariam said, uh, the occasion of this event is the, the publication of the, this year's edition of the Right to Food and Nutrition Watch, which is entitled uh, Overcoming Ecological Crisis, Reconnecting Food, Nature, and Human Rights. Um, it might be good to, yeah, to explain briefly what this publication is. Um, um, so the Right to Food and Nutrition Watch is an annual publication that 
uh, we publish every year since 2008. And every year, um, the watch uh, looks into issues that are related to um, uh, the, the, the right to food and nutrition. Um, it's a publication uh, of the Global Network for the Right to Food and Nutrition, which is a broad network of social movements and organization that uh, work on food related issues and are committed to the right to food um, at different levels. Um, we have grassroots organizations and, and also organizations that are involved in, in advocacy at, at, at national and international level. Um, and, and as I said, every, every edition of the watch has uh, a thematic focus and, and, and this year um, as a network and together with the editorial board of, of the watch um, decided to um, dedicate this edition to this uh, intersection or this look into the interlinkages between um, ecology, ecological questions and, and human rights. And, and, and since our focus is on the right to food, um, um, we also do that by taking food as a central part um, or a central element in this, in this context. Um, it will not be difficult or impossible to uh, summarize uh, the content of this year's Right to Food and Nutrition Watch um, um, in only a few minutes. So, so um, but I would all invite you all to, to read it and to engage with it. And, and I can also say that we would also uh, uh, welcome any feedback uh, that, you, that you may have. Um, but let me say that uh, one central issue um, of this year's watch or this year's edition um, is the issue of connection. Um, um, I think it's about connecting issues. So as I said, ecology and human rights, but connecting also um, a pandemic that the pandemic that we're uh, experiencing and connecting that to issues that are related to the corporate food regime, uh, for instance. It's also about connecting movements and struggles, like environmental and climate justice struggles with human rights and social justice struggles. I think it's also connecting, about connecting critical research and, 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 and policy um, demands. And it's also about looking into connecting trends like, uh, that, like veganism that are um, kind of vibrant in, in some contexts in the global north specifically and, and how that also connects to uh, uh, the experience and the views of, of small scale food producers um, elsewhere. Um, but apart from that, I think um, the, this, the Right to Food and Nutrition Watch also speaks about a deeper connection that we have as individual society uh, to the natural world. And, and it argues very strongly that there is a need for um, a reconnection. There is a need for a reconnection because there is a separation um, and, and that this separation is, is one of the main reasons for the ecological crisis that we are facing and, and, and which themselves are part also of a broader crisis that is also uh, has social aspects and, and, and economic aspects. So this year's uh, Right to Food and Nutrition Watch uh, shed some light on the roots of this separation and or disconnect. And, and it argues that it is intrinsically linked to the way that our modern societies are organized, namely uh, on the basis of a capitalistic model that is uh, based on domination and, and exploitation, both of the natural environment as well as of humans. And Based on this analysis, the watch also provides some elements for a pathway that may as allow to overcome the separation and kind of reset or reorganize our societal relationship with nature. Food and our food system are central to this project because uh, food is, um, is, is, is a field, is an area, is something that very strongly connects us to the living world um, that we are part of. And um, as, as many of the organizations and the people involved in, the, in this publication come from a back, human rights um, background, uh, obviously we also, the watch also speaks about what human rights can be in, um, in, in, the, in this transformation and, and, and what entry points international law 
can provide us. This is not to say that our struggles need to be only or primarily legal, but it's based on the uh, on the on the on the on the on the idea that we have to use the tools that we have at our disposal and use them and make them advance so we can advance um, like to this reconnection or transformation that we, that we need. So before back handing back to the to the moderator and to the panel discussion, um, I would just like to close with a final um, remark. And that is when, when you look at, at the title of the watch, but also in many of our day to day in our work and our struggles, um, when we speak about issues, terms or thing, issues like, like nature or, or reconnection or, or transformation, I think it's important that we keep in mind that these are terms that are highly contested today. Um, because if you read or listen to statements by some governments, you know, and even some of the worst <laughs> governments that, that we have, if we listen to corporations and, and financial brokers or, or some of the big conservation groups, you know, you will realize that they use some of the same language in the same way. So therefore, um, they're a part of our work and our struggles as organization movements that are committed to human rights and to environmental climate and social justice is also to dispute these concepts and these terms and fill them with a meaning that actually paves the way uh, towards systemic change. So the Right to Food and Nutrition Watch is, is a start. I think it provides some elements to that and I'm very sure that today's conversation will also help us um, and to further advance. And um, with this, I would like to hand back to, to Mariam and, and I'm looking forward to, to, to the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Philip, for that good overview um, of really some of the, I think this is an ambitious uh, edition of the watch because these are really such fundamental uh, topics. Um, and we're dealing with them at, uh, at a time which is so challenging for so many of us. Um, so I would like to open uh, the discussion by introducing briefly Danilo or Dani Caranza, who is a longtime rural community organizer and a farmer. He is the Secretary General of Catarungan, which is uh, the acronym in, in, um, is the Movement for Agrarian Reform and Social Justice a rural mass movement which has a long history of struggle for land rights and agrarian justice in the Philippines. So Danny, thank you for uh, being with us today. We wanted to open um, this reflection um, by asking someone like you who has um, a wealth and a long history of grassroots movements um, on the ground. Um, the question to you is how do you use human rights practically to challenge climate change and ecological crisis on the ground. Over to you. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, thank you to all the panelists and to um, those who are present in this webinar. Um, the current ecological crisis often cause widespread devastation among both rural and urban communities. Floods, drought, strong typhoons, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, among others, result in incalculable losses to the most vulnerable sectors of society, including small food producers. Uh, surviving the manifestations of ecological crisis in the form of extreme weather events is pure luck for many small food producers. Building back from such devastation is a difficult task, even more so if you are to use the catchphrase, build back better. <clears throat> the current ecological crisis exposed the vulnerabilities of the poor and the marginalized. Those without formal property rights to land and housing are often excluded from humanitarian assistance even by international humanitarian uh, organizations. Worse, they are subjected to cruel impositions that threaten their basic human rights, such as declaring an area a no-build zone, quote unquote, 
or no dwelling zone, quote or unquote, were small fishing communities and indigenous peoples living in small islands are living. Farmers without land tenure security are often deprived of support to rebuild devastated farms in cases where land is subject of compet competing claims between a corporation or a landlord and uh, versus the farmers, the government, at least in the case of the Philippines, normally acquiesce to corporate or landlord and allow the interest of business or landlords to prevail at the expense of farmers' right to land, shelter, livelihood, and even to basic humanitarian assistance. Uh, this is especially when the farmers or peasants are unorganized. Losses due to trade liberalization often force farmers to accept what a, whatever is available from the state. For example, subsidized hybrid seeds and, and organic inputs. Bankruptcy caused by losses from trade liberalization policies and devastation from extreme weather events leave farmers with no choice but to take whatever assistance comes from the government, even if it means uh, reinforcing the dangers brought about by environmentally destructive farming practices. Hence, transitioning to agroecology, meaning organic and sustainable farming practices, becomes a very difficult undertaking for ordinary farmers because one, state policies are biased towards corporate controlled agro-industrial food system. Uh, two, devastation of farms have become constant with the regularity of extreme weather events. Rebuilding is often difficult after devast a devastating loss and farmers are starting from the scratch or even negative all over again. Alternative agroecological science and technology are often not accessible in many isolated rural areas. Land grabs often, and fourth, land grabs often become more palatable in areas where resistance is slow due to weakened capacity of devastated communities to resist. It is precisely when the state falls to provide adequate protection such as against harassment, intimidation, physical attacks, criminalization, as well as uh, the need for assistance in emergency situations, uh, including uh, the need to respect basic right to land, housing, and livelihoods, among others, that we as grassroots movement use or invoke human rights. One, as a platform of resistance or struggle, against evictions, exclusion, against forcible taking of lands, and for organizing and building rights-based innovative and creative community resistance. Two, for demanding state, uh, increased state accountability. In many instances, state escapes primary accountability uh, from the threats, sufferings, and actual damages caused or resulting from ecological crisis. In fact, if human rights are to serve its purpose, it has to be in such a way that states, among many others, are forced to recognize and take up its main responsibility or obligation to human rights. Meaning, uh, making, uh, this means uh, making standards of state response consistent with human rights and such basic demands as the right to food, housing, humanitarian assistance, and land, among others and making sure that state policies do not aggravate the situation of people, especially the most vulnerable. Uh, second, we use or invoke human rights in pushing for uh, rights-based policy reforms. Uh, human rights should be a measuring stick in which the state is made to account for its actions or inactions. Hence, it is important that state adopt policies that are consistent with human rights standard. An important policy that should be constantly pursued is the right of rural communities to their land and territory, as this is a basic requirement if the pursuit of agroecological alternative is to gain ground. Without this, the pursuit of agroecology will fail. In particular, 
in our case, land te tenure security and access rights to fishing grounds and control over territory by indigenous peoples is essential for small scale producers to be resilient to ecological crisis because this gives them the necessary assets to build back and start or continue creating a more sustainable, ecolo ecologically nurturing alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Danny. Um, it was a great overview and a synthesis of the work that you're doing. I would love if there's time later to hear some some concrete examples of, of some of the struggles you've engaged with and using human rights. But there'll be more time for that later. Thank you very much. Um, we now have uh, the pleasure of listening to Esther stanford Jose, uh, as I said, from uh, the co-founder of the Extinction Rebellion Internationalist Solidarity Network. Esther is a legal specialist in jurisprudence and a reparations activist. She focuses on African self-determination from a contemporary Black nationalist perspective. So Esther, um, uh, the question I'd like to ask you is, how is climate justice related to decolonization struggles? Over to you. Uh, I think you're muted, Esther. Could you? Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Great to be here and participating in this important session today. So for me, the, the struggle for climate justice is, is very much integral, uh, integrally connected to decolonization struggles. And if we're thinking about how we address uh, the climate and ecological crises uh, in a way that also includes equity and the realization of human and people's rights, that cannot happen without effective decolonization. If we look at patterns of colonization and coloniality of power, how it exists today, we can see that much of um, the planet's wealth is concentrated in a few hands of just so-called 80 individuals and a sixth of the world's population that are qualified as uh, hungry and more so impoverished. And then when we look at uh, patterns of the industrial, um, current industrial food system, where we're seeing there's use of, you know, what in excess of about 75% of the world's agricultural land, and most of it, you know, um, being based on the use of fossil fuels, and also the extraction of resources, which barely feed about 30% of the world's population. In contrast, we know that there are more than 500 million so-called peasant farmers around the world that are using less than 25% of land with hardly any use of fossil fuels or chemicals to feed 70% of the world's population. So those structures and patterns of inequality, which are based on the history of colonization, uh, enslavement and dispossession of peoples impact our reality today. And we cannot therefore have uh, true uh, climate justice, ecological justice, uh, reparatory justice, which I'm a huge um, advocate of, without having kind of fundamental social transformation and systemic change. Uh, that's just where we're at in terms of the writing on the wall and where it's been in truth for a long time and where a lot of those who have been in resistance, actually, this is what they have been advocating throughout the generations. So the first question then, really, that confronts all colonized peoples is uh, the, the question of restoring or, or redressing their dispossession. And a big part of that is about access to land, okay? And not so much in terms of the privatized model of land ownership, which unfortunately is part of that dispossession and part of the harm, but recognizing that actually uh, when we have um, studies that have been done that show that uh, people like Queen Elizabeth II uh, holds legal title supposedly to one sixth of planet Earth. Uh, 
that's a, that's a shocking statistic and that the biggest kind of um, descriptor or, 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 or thing that joins people who are dispossessed is their lack of access to land, okay? And to be able to use it sustainably for people's um, needs. So decolonization is a necessary imperative. Uh, imperative. Uh, we know that colonization was a process of dispossession and extraction of labor and natural resources for the benefit of colonizers that continue to, to in, in terms of their progeny, continue to benefit from those historic patterns of colonization and dispossession that have polluted our land, polluted our waters, polluted our air, and in particular in territories that have been lived on for millennia by peoples of the global south. The, the, the majority world essentially. So we need to have a, a true decolonization, not just a, a tagline, a strap line, a, a kind of politically correct thing to say because everywhere is talking about, people are talking about decolonize this and decolonize that. As has already been said, decolonization is not a metaphor. It's not a swappable term for other things that we want to do to improve society, um, you know, that don't actually fundamentally address the power imbalances that are there from colonization. And when I think about a, a definition of decolonization that many of the communities of resistance that we in the Extinction Rebellion Internationalist Solidarity work with, we are kind of very much informed by the, the definition from Unsettling America. And they argue that decolonization means the revitalization of indigenous sovereignty and an end to settler do domination of life, lands and peoples in uh, the territories of the so-called Americas or Abiyala. So therefore all decisions regarding human interactions with the land base, including who lives on it, should rightfully belong to those whose lands you know they are in terms of stewardship and custodianship not in that kind of uh, colonial model of of private ownership and so it's about reversing that and a, a key aspect of reversing that is looking at a repair framework or reparations framework and um, oftentimes when people hear the word reparations they think about money or financial compensation and the mass media does tend to promote that quite a bit. Uh, but a big aspect of what struggles for repair have been actually involve land uh, restitution and a key aspect of uh, reparations under international law is restitution. In fact, the United Nations framework on a right to a remedy and reparation for victims of violations of international human rights law and um, you know, serious uh, violations of international humanitarian law, recognize that there are five key aspects to reparation. So first of all, there has to be a stopping of the harm, what's known as a cessation of the violation. So stopping the land grabs, stopping the extractivism, stopping the killing of indigenous peoples and other communities in the global south, who are killed because they are seeking to defend those lands and how those lands get used as opposed and, and resisting land grabs and occupations. It also includes guarantees of non-repetition. How do we ensure that we create a food system, a, a land use system, you know, an agrarian system that actually doesn't repetition? those harms. Uh, then it would include measures such as restitution and a big part of restitution is uh, indigenous sovereignty, the sovereignty of, of majority populations, uh, communities in Africa, in Asia, in Abiyala and other parts of the global south. Of course, there's compensation which most people think about when they think about a repair framework. But Compensation is not just about money, it's about putting an economic value on harm, on dispossession, on what is being lost. 
And then there is measures of satisfaction, which many people refer to as symbolic reparation. Um, and and that, that is all the aspects that communities need to feel satisfied that there has been a level of redress because some of the harms that have been caused throughout centuries cannot totally be undone. Uh, and then there's rehabilitation, the whole aspect that goes with it, that is about the restoration, not only of the sovereignty, but also the agency of indigenous peoples and other communities in the global south, communities of resistance. That is the work that we're trying to do as Extinction Rebellion Internationalist Solidarity Network, by working with communities of resistance, on the ground so it's very grassroots ground up which is where the real change is going to happen and unless we can cultivate and mobilize and help support the self-organization of these groupings that exist outside of the uh, NGOs and uh, the NGOization of their own resistance, then we're not going to see the levels of changes that are required. And finally, I just want to emphasize that this issue about um, you know, decolonization and stopping the harm of today is really, really key. When we see, I'm based in the UK, the UK government has just actually passed uh, a couple of days ago something called the Covert Human Intelligence Sources Criminal Conduct Bill. And what this does, it actually gives license to state agents, including people in the Food Standards um, Agency, um, Competition and Marketing, the Environmental Agency, to commit crimes lawfully, get away with it under the guise of protecting the interests of the state. And this would include crimes of uh, murder, torture, rape, all the, all the crimes that we know are happening to our land defenders all around the world. And this is a serious turn of events. And it does raise the question of the responsibility that we have in the global north as well to tackle governments at source here, that are, are a large part of extorting the model of harm and maldevelopment overseas. So that's a key responsibility on us. Uh, and that must go hand in hand with supporting the struggles of the de decolonizational struggles of, of indigenous peoples and other majority world communities in the global south. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Thank you very much, Esther, um, for this very powerful intervention, which um, for me, the, the first thing that I took away from it was uh, the, this, this very important reminder of the, 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 the role of history. And in the world that I tend to work in, which is, let's say, broadly, um, a somehow international development, um, uh, it, it, history is absent, it's totally disappeared, you know, and to remind us that if we want to get to the root of um, some of the huge challenges we have today, we have to look back into the history, which is still alive, it's still alive and it doesn't let go. So that erasing of history is really um, a problem. Um, like Danny, I would love to have more time to ask you about specific and concrete examples of the work that you do, the support that you give to communities in their decolonization struggles. So maybe if there's more time, I would ask for a couple of examples. Sure. Um, but now I would like to uh, move on to our third panelist, who is Marta Rivera Ferre. Um, Marta is assistant professor at the University of Vic, the Central University of Catalonia. She coordinates the research line Sustainable Communities, Social Innovations and Territories, and focuses on the analysis of society, environment, interactions, within agri-food systems. So Martha, um, the question that has, has been posed to you is, is a transition towards agroecology a key to addressing the crisis? I have a feeling that you would say yes, so maybe I would change the question a little bit and ask you to talk about, you know, why is this uh, a key and, and how do we support this, um, the transition towards agroecology? Over to you. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Um, thank you also the Right to Food and Nutrition Watch. Um, yo voy a hablar en castellano, 
también por dar un poquito de diversidad al, al diálogo y la discusión de hoy. Agradecer a, a los observadores del derecho a la alimentación y a la nutrición por debate. la organización del bueno, por el anuario y por la organización del evento. En relación a la pregunta, Sorry, yo creo que para poder responder a esto, lo primero que tenemos que tener claro Now, in order to answer es que la crisis la first thing that we need to be clear about, about as, as Philip mentioned, is that the current agricultural crisis and ecological crisis is not uh, something that is uh, separate from everything else. It's also rela related to an economic, global, social and economic crisis related to capitalism. It has to do with uh, the grabbing of uh, resources, individualism, competitivity and uh, other factors that uh, exacerbate the ecological crisis, which then is also linked to the current health crisis, as well as many social crises that we're facing around injustice, around uh, gender issues and uh, other issues that have been mentioned by previous speakers. In this regard, when we talk about agroecology and when we mention here the transition to agroecology, I'm not referring to agroecology as uh, isolated practices, but rather as part of a system, a social, economic and ecological system. Therefore, these practices are part of a context. One second, just there's been a comment in the chat asking you to slow down a little bit. Could you, could you speak a bit more slowly? Okay, uh, maybe I speak in English. I don't know, maybe in English I speak a bit slow, slower and it's easier. So, uh, I think I, I will speak in English, maybe. Uh, I don't know, I do get the sense that most of the participants might be more Anglophone than Spanophone. So maybe okay. that would be an idea. Uh, no, but then <laughs> we also have a keep, comment. Keep the diversity, Diver perfect. Keep the diversity. Just, yeah. But could you also on the um, Spanish channel, could you choose in Spanish in your, in your, in your, you know, in the bottom right, there's a, there's a globe. Uh, so can you hear Marta now? Okay. Yeah, I think. Me? Uh, okay, sí. Perfect. Okay. Um, por tanto, como, como decía... Okay. Eh, Martha, could you please speak closer to the microphone? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can go back. Sorry for this interruption. No, it's fine. Um, so, um, entonces, como decía, entender que... We have to see that this ecological crisis is the result of a global social crisis. We have to see it from a social economic perspective, not just because it's an economic crisis as such, but rather because it's underpinned by a social economic system from the global level, which is extractivist in nature and based on the exploitation of nature and the exploitation of people. So bearing this in mind and seeing as if that everything is interlinked, we have to take a food systems approach. As you know, looking at the last report of the IPCC, you will know that 50% uh, of land on a global scale is used for agriculture. Therefore, food system plays a key role as do greenhouse and gas emissions, climate change, and the degradation overall of land, contamination, and pollution of waters and deforestation on a global scale. So indeed, this ecological crisis is indeed linked to a multiple civilization crisis. So when it comes to food systems, which play a key role in also people's well-being, in communities' lives, and in the production of food, 
It is through the production of food that we can provide healthy food and uh, exercise the right to food. But it's also about uh, producers being able to have a dignified life and decent income, as well as the capacity to exercise their right to food. Of course, other issues around justice and gender, for instance. So if we see the ecological crisis from a much more multi-systemic multi uh, perspective, if we can see how all of these crises are interlinked, then this is why and how agroecology plays such a key role at uh, a global scale. Agroecology is often just approached from as a set of practices. Those of us who work in agroecology for many years now, be it uh, among social movements or at the institutional level, we know that agroecology is a tool to gain food sovereignty. Therefore, we cannot separate agroecology and food sovereignty and all the rights that are related to food sovereignty. Therefore, in some Agroecology allows us to have a critical overview of all the dimensions, the socio-economic dimensions that allow us to analyze the social and economic factors of food consumption, of short circuits, for instance. But then we also have the political and cultural dimensions of food production. And here I'm referring to the political dimensions of the right to food and nutrition. And when it comes to agroecology, I'm also referring here to the uh, technical and technological practices. So by taking a more systems approach, we're able to see that agroecology is more in tune with nature. So these are the three dimensions that agroecology approaches, not just as a way to address the ecological crisis, but also all other crises that are related to our uh, civilization and also to the current capitalistic system. There is another key issue that we need to look at when it comes to the uh, transition to agroecology into uh, local peasant communities who demand agroecology because they identify with agroecology as a way of practicing their form of agriculture and culture. It's not a top-down approach, such as the Green Revolution was once upon a time, or, or as we now see with all these technological solutions that are sold as a, a one-size-fits-all solution for all food producers. especially when it comes to the cultural and social aspects of agroecology. But agroecology is a bottom-up process, and it's the communities themselves that are demanding it. And this is what we saw in 2015 during the Agroecology Forum. We saw that uh, social movements demanding food sovereignty said that agroecology was their way of producing food and of realizing food sovereignty. So now looking at the scientific dimension, we also have to highlight the role of local, traditional and indigenous knowledge. There are other areas of uh, agricultural science that uh, um, produce knowledge from the university, which is a top-down approach because they don't take into account local traditional knowledge or the local uh, cultural aspects. However, agroecology is built on the premise of indigenous knowledge in such a way as to build agroecological systems overall. And for those of us who work in science, this of course is essential. We are part of a society in which uh, scientific knowledge is considered to be superior to other forms of knowledge. 
However, agroecology turns this on its head because agroecology is the cornerstone for building uh, alternative systems that take into account the social, economic, political, and of course, ecological dimensions. Now, another important issue is that uh, this is very different to corporate industrial agriculture, which has led to this uh, social economic crisis, this political crisis, and of course, this uh, health crisis and ecological crisis that we're experiencing. There's another very important uh, aspect we need to remember. Agroecology is life-centric. Life is at the heart, not capital extraction. At the heart of agroecology is life itself, the life of peoples and the life of ecosystems. Just as we're discussing today in the today's panel, it's about reconnecting uh, with uh, nature, reconnecting food, nature, and human rights, like the title of the watch. So there's a certain humility that is required in order to assess how we approach scientific knowledge. One Health is one of these uh, steps that has been made in scientific knowledge lately where there's a recognition that the planet's health, animals' health and human health are all interlinked. So this has uh, been acknowledged as a step forward, as a progress in science. Nevertheless, if we look at indigenous cosmovisions, that's already there, that's already part of their very being. The health, of the planet and human health have always been interlinked as a more uh, holistic approach in the indigenous cosmovision and this is also fed into agroecology but it seems that now we have the need to reconnect because of the socio-economic system and cultural system that we are part of that we are embedded in and as we said it is fragmented and this is why, sadly, we now find ourselves in this situation where we have the need to reconnect. Perhaps I would also like to highlight that uh, in this regard, we see that there is no institutional recognition of agroecology. Recently, a report was published where it was shown that, for instance, in research, many of the resources are fed into uh, conventional agriculture and not into the development and the analysis of agroecological systems. So indeed, communities demand the capacities to be able to work in developing agroecological systems Apologies, there was an interruption there of sound. So I would leave it here, says Marta. That's just to conclude now my intervention. Thank you, says Marta. Back to the floor. Thank you very much, Marta. Um, these are topics very um, close to my heart uh, and my experience, and our paths have crossed many times on exactly these issues. Um, I find it interesting that you were talking about agroecology as a contested term. Esther was talking about decolonization as a contested term. And Philip was reminding us that uh, even it, terms like reconnecting with nature are also contested. So perhaps that's an area that we can explore in the Q&A. What, what do we do with all these contested terms? And is there a way of defending a, a certain understanding um, or is it is it more about having an effective dialogue um, or constantly inventing new terms once certain terms are appropriated? Um, I'm not sure, but I think that's an interesting thread 
running through our discussion. Um, uh, lastly, I'd like to pass the floor to Marcos Orellana, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Toxics and Human Rights. Marcos international law and law on human rights and the environment. He has been legal advisor to several UN agencies, governments and non-governmental organizations, including on wastes and chemicals. Um, he has extensive experience working with civil society around the world on issues concerning global environmental justice. So Marcus, um, what, how do you think that human rights can support our efforts to respond to the ecological crisis. Over to you. Muchas, eh, muchas gracias, Marian, por, eh, por la pregunta y también... Mm -hmm. eh, Sorry, you're muted, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm not yeah. muted. Uh, okay. You're speaking in Spanish? Now? Yes. Sí, estoy hablando en español. Okay, the speaker has just started. Can you hear the English booth now? Okay, testing the English booth. Perfecto, gracias. Sí, gracias nuevamente, Mariam, por la presentación y también... Thank you once again, Mariam, for this presentation. And here I'd also like to thank Fian for inviting me to be here uh, at this launch of the Right to Food and Nutrition Watch of 2020. The previous speakers have uh, placed much emphasis on overcoming this fragmentation that we see uh, when it comes to the need for humanity to reconnect to nature. So with regard to this question, how can human rights support the responses to the ecological crises? Well, I have three things to say. First of all, human rights recognize principles and these principles allow us to assess the legitimacy of climate action as the question well points out we are facing three global ecological crises climate change the loss of biodiversity but also a silent chemical pandemics such as pollution and being exposed to dangerous uh, chemicals and dangerous waste now here we have to look at the principles of participation, transparency and accountability as key. They are key to the solutions of the crisis. And these solutions to the ecological crisis uh, should not aggravate discrimination or indeed the structural inequalities that underlie the crises we find that uh, structural inequalities are underlying to these crises because there's a larger division between the haves and the have-nots, those who are able to connect, those who are not able to connect, for instance, and those who have land and those who are uh, dispossessed from their land. Now, the Paris Agreement recognizes this, and here the, side, the, the image has frozen. The Paris Agreement recognizes human rights in its preamble, and this allows us to, uh, to put into practice these uh, practices that I have mentioned when it comes to, for instance, elaborating the NDCs, the contributions which are a cornerstone of the Paris Agreement, these nationally determined contributions because each country has to establish what their national determined contributions will be at the national level in such a way as to pave the way uh, towards uh, uh, limiting warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Therefore, we need transparency when it comes to these NDCs as well as uh, participation and accountability, as I mentioned before. What is also at stake is uh, the need to assess parameters for assessing uh, the sufficiency of these NDCs. Is it really sufficient to have national determined contributions and uh, uh, the need to limit uh, warming? 
human rights gives us tools to assess this. It, this would be my first step towards what human rights can uh, provide to support these responses to the ecological crisis. Human rights also provide us with a vocabulary, with terminology to contest uh, to contest the current situation. Just a couple of examples. The right to benefit from scientific progress. A UN committee on, well, the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, just a couple of months ago, developed a general recommendation with regard to the use of scientific uh, uh, knowledge for the development of policies, policies that are evidence-based, i.e. based on scientific evidence. This is particularly important when it comes to developing policies for eliminating pesticides and for research and agriculture overall. This general observation also mentioned the need for donors to not necessarily channel their funds to corporations that unduly influence research. There are many examples, as we already know, where industry and private uh, corporations are financing studies that unduly influence research and therefore hence the need the right to be able to benefit from evidence generated by research and this is key when it comes to enabling civil society empowerment and this is not the only example we can also talk about how human rights recognizes the rights of peasants to define their own agricultural policies. This is related to the UN DROP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of uh, Peasants and other uh, peoples working in rural areas where food sovereignty has been recognized. So here we see that uh, there's also vocabulary for defending rights, but also how to link this to um, environmental issues. Another example is FPIC, Free Prior and Informed Consent, with regard to the rights of indigenous peoples, which safeguards their, uh, the, their self-determination in this um, free prior and informed consent. And it's also part of the UN Declaration of Human Rights when it comes to self-determination. Now, a last example is the right to a healthy environment. We have found this right being enshrined in several constitutions around the world. And this again is linked to procedural uh, aspects such as information, access to information, participation in decision making and access to justice, uh, social environmental justice. These again are sources of empowerment for civil society, but they're not just procedural elements, they also uh, have substance, substantive dimensions such as the right not to be exposed to hazardous uh, substances and toxic waste, also a right to a biodiverse, rich ecosystem, and a right to a safe climate. And governments need to start implementing these rights so that civil society also have, a have vocabulary made available to leverage this pressure. So these are just some examples of what human rights can provide in terms of supporting the response to the current ecological crisis. And now, last but not least, as part of uh, these reflections, I would just like to add that human rights establishes a clear framework for duty bearers. For instance, ETOs, extraterritorial obligations, these can help us to overcome obstacles when it comes to uh, national borders and the effective enjoyment of human rights. 
This is also linked to corporate accountability. And these are not just extraterritorial obligations, they're also environmental obligations. You may well remember that a couple of months ago there was a, an enormous uh, blast in Beirut, Lebanon. And during that blast, tons of ammonium nitrate were released, uh, leading to uh, thousands of deaths and hundreds of thousands of displacements. Much attention has been placed on how dangerous ammonium nitrate is and how combustible it is. But however, I also think that uh, we need to focus much more on the environmental risks that are linked to ammonium nitrate. States have a duty to address environmental risks, for instance, when we look at uh, uh, nitrogen-based fertilizers, because ammonium nitrate is just not explosive, it's also used in fertilizers. So what we see are emissions of nitrous oxide, and this is a GHG, and this GHG is 300 times more powerful than uh, a carbon dioxide. Just a couple of weeks ago, at the beginning of October, a scientific report was presented by uh, 57 scientists from 14 countries. And this report uh, states that emissions of nitrous oxide increased by 30% in the last four years decades. And if we are not able to implement effective measures to address the effects of these emissions, then what we see is that we're actually going to um, be pushed beyond the three degrees. And therefore, the Paris, agreements, uh, Paris Agreement would not be fulfilled. So here, we see that there are many risks related to dangerous uh, toxic substances and the need for states to address these risks. Here, we can also mention how nitrogen cycles are upset, leading to eutrophication in thousands of square kilometers, for instance, in the Gulf of Mexico, which have led to these dead zones because of the abuse of nitrogen-based fertilizers in uh, agriculture. Uh, previous panelists mentioned agroecology and how important it is to also look at healthy soils in uh, the uh, NDCs with regard to climate change. So indeed, human rights offer us several tools and mechanisms, and above all, they provide us with a vocabulary that empowers civil society to contest uh, the current situation and to ensure that there is state accountability and it provides us with principles to legitimately address uh, the current climate change crisis. Thank you and back to the floor. Thank you very much, um, Marcus. Um, it's, um, I think it's an exciting area, this convergence between human rights law and environmental law. You gave some good examples of that, which are also touched on in the watch. Um, and as you mentioned, um, we now have to um, look to implementation. No? How are these, these new, this new approach to linking, you know, uh, our lives as human beings, but also our connection with nature. How is this new approach in law actually going to have an impact? Um, so maybe that's one of the things that we can uh, focus on in, in the question and answer. Um, we have much less time than I, than I had planned for question and answer. I am sorry to say that uh, so many discussions end up like this, um, but uh, we are open. The floor is open for questions from the floor. Please raise your hand. I see already one, one hand is, is raised. And, um, and so we, I think we can take maybe three or four questions 
either direct them to a single panelist or several panelists. Um, and yeah, let's start, let's maybe start with the three questions that we have, the three raised hands now, and then give it back to the panel and see how much time we have left after that. So I'd first like to give the floor to Ahmed. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see your last name in my, in my um, box here. But Ahmed, uh, please, Durani. you have the floor. Please turn on your microphone and your video. Yes, uh, moment, very quickly here. Hello, Ahmed, so have, Ahmed uh, Surani. Yes, yes, um, yeah, hello. Um, I can't see. Is there anything that I should be doing to turn yes, on yes, Ahmed? Yes, I'm not yes. sure. Um, yeah, I will use my voice. Do you hear me now? Uh, maybe we jump to the next one and come back to Ahmed if, if there's any problem with that. I hello? see the next person on my list, at least. Um, no. is Claudio, Claudio Schuftan. Hello, Claudio. Hi. Okay, great. Go ahead. Do I have a, a video also or only audio? Yeah, no, you can turn on the video if you want. I don't have the icon for the video. Oh, okay, well, go ahead, because we're, um, we're kind of- I wanted to show something, but anyway, perhaps oh, we can fix it. Anyway, okay, go ahead. I don't know how many people, Mariam, are on our webinar today. It's and about eight. I'm, sh I'm sure that all of you have been having webinaritis in the last three or four months, much more so since the pandemic. And we keep, I mean, if you are the followers of the native changes that have been so eloquently presented by the speakers. It is all clear that we do have an underlying problem that goes over every single area that we more specifically work on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why I wanted to show something, but anyway, I'll explain it to you. And it's called the shish kebab problem. As you know, in a shish kebab, there is the morsels of meat and there is the skewer that goes through the morsels of meat. Now, we have different people in our 82 persons today that primarily work on one morsel or on the other morsel or on the other morsel on a day-to-day -day basis. And they work almost nothing or much less in the problem of the skewer that goes through every single one of the morsels, which is all the structural reasons that we are where we are, that our panelists have so expertly presented from different angles. So the question is, given the dire situation that this planet is on, that this world of ours is on, what percentage of my time and of your time should be spent on fighting the skewer much more than you are fighting what you do every day in the morsel. That is the key question. We keep talking about all of these things, but come Monday, we continue doing what we do every day. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio, for getting to some fundamental questions. Um, I'd like to ask Ahmed now, because I think, I think the problem is solved. Ahmed, can you, yes, can you yes, put on your mic now? and speak? Yes, thank mm, you, Mariam. I thank still you, don't hear you. I was, you. I was told that maybe you were on the lo wrong language channel. That yeah, you would do have you to hear me now? English. I'm putting English. Ah, you can hear Ahmed. Why, why can't I hear Ahmed? Do you hear me now? Um, Hello? Okay, okay. Sorry. Yes, we do. Oh, I see. Yes, that. great. Thank you very much, uh, Fian, and all for the good presentations and for such a very important interactive session. Um, yeah, it was really very useful. But I would like to just try to uh, raise the issue of uh, the need for all of us as development actors to shift from needs or to advocate actually shifting from needs to, to rights. 
because uh, unfortunately most of the uh, the uh, the international programs most of them are very much based on the needs of the local communities um, and and we do believe in Palestine as well as in Gaza under such very uh, difficult conditions and the protracted crisis situation uh, that uh, the influencing the policy and advocacy uh, for uh, uh, concentrating more on the local resources as well as the locally developed positive coping strat strategies by the local communities in crisis situation, uh, it's time to, uh, to evaluate these local experience knowledge um, and also uh, not always to concentrate on the needs, but it's time also to, to consider the rights of the local communities the rights of the local communities, producers, I mean, in this case, farmers, small scale farmers, to raise their voice uh, regarding their, uh, the, uh, the, their rights. Do you think it's time to, uh, to advocate this important issue shifting from needs to rights? Marian, please finish. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> I just, uh, I'm sorry. I just said a whole sentence and I didn't realize I was on mute. I said thank you to Ahmed. And I gave the floor to the next person, who is um, Marcos. Uh, Marcos Arana, please. Hola, voy a, voy a hablar este en, en español. I'm going to speak in Spanish. I would like to highlight the fact that during this pandemic, the fact that this pandemic comes from an environmental crisis hasn't been highlighted enough and the breeding grounds of this pandemic was the industrial agriculture and the industrial production of food, especially uh, animal food products. And this served as a smoke screen against a world a movement against climate change that has been erased from the global agenda because of the pandemics. The resources that have been devoted to fighting the um, financial impacts have been larger than the resources devoted to the to fighting against climate change in the last years. This tendency is very, very dangerous. It has been highlighted that hunger may be one of the causes of the pandemics. And with that, um, they are trying to um, use ag uh, industrial agriculture as a response. It has been, and proof of this is that the World Food Program has been a candidate to this year's Nobel Prize. That is a sign of what's happening. So maybe we should use this opportunity to highlight the importance of strengthening, strengthening traditional agricultural systems as a way of responding to this crisis and avoiding future crises that are looming over and that maybe will happen in the next decades if we follow this trend. Right now, it's very important to use this context to make the interconnection between these pandemics evident and to talk about the support to industrial agricultural. This is a very important element that has been left behind. So we need to emphasize the connection between industrial agriculture and all the problems that have been um, mentioned by the United Nations as the great threats like climate change, pollution, violence, the commercial trends that are creating unhealthy uh, lifestyles. Right now, my country, Mexico, is being threatened and the consequences of the pandemics have been terrible, especially because of the consequences of uh, bad eating habits and the 
emergence of um, terrible um, food. My country has a terrible pandemics of diabetes that are aggravated by the impacts of COVID-19. So I think we should make the most of this moment. There's not that much time. This is a, an urgent concern. We have to make evident the connection between these pandemics and industrial agriculture. I think it is high time to strengthen our work to enhance traditional systems and a new a lifestyle based on healthy eating habits. Thank you very much. The discussion so far, we didn't hear much talk about this pandemic, but certainly um, uh, in in this edition of the Right to Food and Water Watch, there's an entire article on it. Uh, let's, but uh, but hopefully we can also get some more discussion on it. I agree, it's a fundamental topic. Um, let's get one last question before handling it, handing it back to the panelists for. <laughs> Um, responses to these questions and comments um, and then I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap up but we've run out of time the last person well the next person on my list not the last person but the next person on my list is Papa uh, Mesa Dieng uh, you have the floor yes thank you very much I don't know why we don't speak in French because I'm a French speaker I'm talking from Senegal my, thank you very much for inviting me in this webinar right to food and nutrition we can't we, uh, after the pandemic we can't right now isolate the, the worldwide situation without considering what we live during this pandemic we learn from this pandemic something crucial and essential which is that uh, the public sector was, was called to intervene. So the question we are asking here in Africa is where is where was the place of the private sector? So the private sector disappeared and didn't intervene any time during this pandemic. Related to food and nutrition, so we, we can say that the problem here in Africa is Africa is targeted like a, a place, like a continent, where right now everybody is moving to get land. And those African land was, are destined to be used by agro-industry. So do you think really that asking, advocating just for resistance of land, of of peasants resistance, peasants organization will be sufficient to face this land grabbing, you know, movement toward Africa, mainly from China and uh, Europe, some European country. Our question, like uh, ecological organization, is: Don't you think it's time to go beyond this? advocating and putting all between movements that revendicate rights and so on and so on, and not integrating political arena. Because what I talked about at the beginning is everything right now from the pandemic became public. So the public service is coming back. And we think that if we want to solve you know, the situation, we have to address it, you know, at the level of public administration, at the level of public policy. So we think it's time, you know, we get in, inside the political arena and claim this kind of rights, right to food, right to nutrition, agroecology, and so on, because we need an alternative from what was the system. The system, you know, show is incapacity to solve uh, human existence on this earth. So I think that we have to go up to another level and bring the advocacy to, into the public, into the political arena. That's the Thank consideration you. I had. Thank you very much, Papa, um, uh, for your intervention. I, I remember you. I remember you at, uh, <laughs> at, 
Yes. I remember you. You remember me at, at, at Rome. Exactly. During... exactly. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Uh, nice to hear your voice again. Um, so uh, certainly from these four questions, only four so far, but from these four questions, there's certainly an appetite to to focus a little bit on on the pandemic, but also connected to these broader questions of human. Rights. I'd like to pass it on to the panelists, starting with um, with Danny. Um, I'm afraid I can only give you about two minutes each for any final reflections uh, before we have to do a very quick wrap up. Uh, Danny? Could you Thank turn you, on? Maria. Okay. Yeah. Um, I didn't get the name of the first questionnaire, but uh, I, I, I'm seeing it as a kind of self reflection of uh, how many efforts are we going to give to this uh, struggle. And I'm seeing it from my, the pers from the perspective when rural activist, uh, my, uh, my, our struggles had, had always been kind of 24 seven. And uh, that's the sense of urgency that we put into, in order to achieve change. Um, so maybe we can invite others to do the same. <laughs> Second, uh, on the question of Ahmed about uh, shifting from needs to right, I, I, I can't really make a distinction or dichotomy between uh, the, the needs, needs and rights. Um, I mean, we use rights to satisfy our needs uh, and we use rights as a, as a platform of struggle to uh, make, to realize that the needs are, uh, are, are uh, addressed by uh, uh, state actors or those which have responsibility to fulfill uh, rights. Um, the issue on the pandemic uh, and uh, the, that uh, it could have been uh, uh, the causes, uh, well, industrial agriculture could have been one of the causes. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and of course, uh, I agree that uh, the proposal of Marcus for the strengthening of traditional food system. In fact, uh, we had a press conference uh, today uh, calling on the government to do just that, no? to make sure that it's the traditional food systems that uh, should be given priority over and above uh, uh, industrial food system. And on the point raised by Papa Mesa on um, going beyond advocating and going into the political arena. Well, um, we, we feel that there are well, kind of parallel lanes to power. Um, agroecology, land rights, and satisfying this, the, the, well, achieving the basic uh, cornerstone of establishing agroecology such as land rights uh, can be done through not just uh, advocacy but struggle at various levels especially at the ground level but the other point that i think he's raising is on the need to go into the government make sure that we have power and influence over there i'm not sure how this is done in other countries but i agree completely that the most important power that uh, reform advocates and change advocates and those advocating systems can have is state power. And that's a challenge as well for mass movements like us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny. I'm really sorry to put this time pressure on people. It would have been great to okay. have further reflections. So quickly going to Esther, and if you could please um, be brief, just touching on what really stood out for you as like the key points. Esther? Esther? Yeah, I'm here. I'm coming. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll be very brief. I think for me, it's really around um, when we're having these conversations around what we're doing and how to bring about the change and what the nature of the change is, the, the question of language and how we use it is really, really key because we could say words and they're understood in particular ways and particular contexts, depending on the language that we speak and our own levels of cognition. But I, I just want to really emphasize um, in terms of everything that's been said, 
and also, you know, taking the sort of analogy of uh, the kebab that we, we was be given, uh, given at the beginning. For me, I see um, a, a repair framework that is premised on international law and stopping the harms uh, is not just about history. It's really about the contemporary harms that are happening today, but recognizing that there are historic patterns to these injustices. And I feel that there needs to be a lot more recognition that many of these frameworks are not new. Um, this is stuff that, you know, the, the newly independent leaders of, for instance, countries in Africa, Asia and Abiy Ayala were calling for in terms of reforms at the level of the international economic order and a new political order and a new legal order and all of these things. And what's happened is that many of those leaders that were trying to implement policies in favor of their peoples, a lot of them were assassinated uh, and, and the struggles were kind of thwarted. So really we're just reliving history and if we fail to implement what was supposed to be done and what previous generations have tried to do, we will keep leaving these battles, um, ones that have to be fought by each subsequent uh, generation. So for me, a repair framework is holistic. There's no issue that anybody has mentioned today that there aren't people who are also championing repair or reparations, who are, who are dealing with agroecology, who are dealing with how we use land, who are looking at the kind of um, governance systems in terms of the political arena. And I close by saying the key thing is about the redistribution of power. All of what people have talked about by way of solution and what people are working on, if people are denied the power to exercise their self-determination, whether it comes to food sovereignty or land sovereignty or resource sovereignty, then that's where we get the key problem. So I'm going to emphasize a repair framework as a fundamental framework that is linked to the decolonization struggle that continues. Thank you very much. Um, these movements and these struggles have overlapped uh, for decades and centuries, but it's really, uh, for me, it's refreshing to have someone from your background coming into discussion, which is perhaps populated more by agroecology types, which I'm usually <laughs> surrounded by. So really, thank you. Um, Marta, I give you the floor now for a quick wrap up. Okay, very briefly, in connection what to what Marcos, Marcos was saying about the pandemic, it's true that the industrial, the corporate and globalized system plays an important role. And the causes are the same causes uh, by which it's playing a role in terms of the um, environmental aspects and also in relation to the social aspects of the crises that we're facing. So yes, I think it is important to claim how the industrial food system and how this system is central in the uh, environmental and health crisis in connection with the pandemics and how it strengthens other narratives as it has been em emphasized during this webinar. And this is connected to the fact that we should not separate agroecology and should not conceive agroecology just as a practice. We should not conceive a industry from the political part. Agricultural industry responds to a political system. It responds to a capitalistic capital extraction system. And agroecology responds to a solidarity system based on trust and mutual support. In fact, during the COVID crisis, this has been seen very clearly. In Catalonia, we carried out uh, research and we saw how agroecological networks have responded and have met the food demands of the most vulnerable by creating mutual solidarity networks to support people who had been facing challenges to uh, market their products and, um, and it, agroecological systems have also helped people who needed to consume those products, the most vulnerable ones. So I think uh, the narrative 
aspects are very important. We shouldn't separate uh, the political aspects from the uh, uh, agricultural aspects because the, we see how um, some people are capable of extracting terms and uh, incorporate them in their own narrative within the capitalistic system. So it is important for um, agricultural practices and techniques to come hand in hand with this political speech that it's the umbrella that they're inserted in. Because if we keep sight of this, we are, um, we are losing our dialectic battle and we need to win in the dialectic arena too. And the terminology is very important and the narrative is very important because it um, helps us realize human rights. In this case, we're talking about the human right to, to food and nutrition. So we really need to achieve this holistic level of integration. Thank you, Marta. What a nice example of showing that uh, agroecology is not just a set of practices, but the social solidarity around the pandemic was really a nice example. Lastly, I'd like to um, give the floor to Marcus. Th thank you uh, again, Mariam, and also thank you again to uh, to Fian for convening this uh, this space and uh, and putting out uh, in a very timely way uh, the right to food and nutrition watch this year, focusing on synergies. Eh, perdón, voy a saltar al español para abordar la pregunta y las reflexiones. Eh. Now I'm going to switch to English as a speaker in order to. Asked to answer some of the questions. For instance, Marco Sarana asked a question. I presented a report to the Human Rights Council last uh, September, in fact, just a few weeks ago. It was actually my predecessor who uh, drafted this report, and it focuses on obligations related to COVID 19. So I would just like to echo uh, Marcos, because we do see a loss of uh, forests. We see deforestation and an expansion of industrial agriculture. And indeed, this does lead to zoonosis, such as the one that we have seen with the coronavirus that has le le led to the COVID-19 disease. That's... Uh, the cause behind COVID-19, i.e. the lack of environmental protection and the indeed deforestation and its connection to industrial agriculture. So that's uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, we also find that people are more vulnerable, especially if they are already Ill, Ill we find that uh, if they are exposed to air pollution, they become more vulnerable to other diseases. We also find this uh, with regard to uh, obesity, NCDs, and other uh, issues related to obesity. So indeed, we find that there's a linkage between environmental protection and the right to food and indeed uh, the right to have adequate uh, food systems as well as food, nu food and nutrition. Which is why I think that uh, Fian's publication is so timely because we find ourselves as a humanity overall having to face existential issues and we have to face up to these interlinkages between agroecology, environmental awareness, and human rights. Thank you, back to the floor. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Marcus. We're already 10 minutes over time. Um, so it, it would have been nice to have the further questions from the floor. I apologize to those who couldn't put their questions. 
Um, but uh, it was a very rich discussion. It doesn't surprise me coming from um, the launch of such a, a rich publication, which I think many of us uh, look forward to receiving around this time every year. Um, and uh, as I said at the beginning, I think the topic, um, it, in some ways it's a kind of broad topic that this, this edition of The Watch tried to address, but it's, it's so, it, it feels so timely that I just feel as if um, there's much more to be said on the topic, uh, perhaps even issues that could further be explored in the next year's uh, watch. Issues of language uh, came up strongly today. Um, the, the, the use of human rights principles and um, uh, the human rights legislation also, um, and this question of convergences between different movements. Um, and certainly, certainly um, food and land issues are really at the heart of many of these convergences. So um, I think many of you are working in movements who are well placed to be in this wave. And I think we're part of this wave now, but certainly some of us are feeling um, a little bit knocked over at this moment by some bigger waves. Um, but we're together and I think that's the important thing and uh, we will continue. So thank you very much uh, for your time and for your inputs and um, look forward to the next watch coming out next year. And I don't know if anyone from Fian wants to have a final, final word. Um, Philip or anyone else? Okay, okay, so um, I guess not. Thank you very much, everyone. Great to be with you. Bye-bye.